everybody and uh, welcome to our sixth seminar of the open uh, on open science organized by the Italian Reproducibility Network. In Christina Bergman will discuss the collaboration collaborating across time and space, how to get the large data set together. The Italian Reproducibility Network, as you know, is a consortium that aims to contribute to the diffusion and dissemination of uh, robust and sound research practices within the Italian uh, community. And uh, we thank, first of all, the uh, Italian Psychological Association, the AIP, that uh, supported the present series of seminars by allowing us to use their Zoom platform. And uh, a, a few initial reminders for or our audience. Uh, first of all, for those of you who are not already a member of the Italian Reproducibility Network, here you see on the slide um, the link. You can go to uh, itrn.org slash community, and uh, there you'll find the, the link to a form to uh, subscribe and uh, so to participate in the network. Um, well, this presentation is being registered and will be made available to you on YouTube, on, on our YouTube channel. So uh, it is a good idea for you to register to our uh, channel as well. So you will um, be in, uh, you'll keep being updated on uh, uh, our materials that we'll uh, post there. And a final reminder is that uh, uh, the call uh, for our meeting in Florence is still open. Uh, the meeting will be on uh, May 13th. And uh, you can, if you want to submit a proposal for uh, that meeting, it, uh, you can do it till April, April 14th. And uh, the call is on, on our uh, website. Uh, so this was it for uh, the announcements for today and um, uh, going to uh, our seminar. Uh, Christina Bergman is uh, our speaker. She has a double affiliation. She is a, she is a senior investigator at the Max Planck Institute for Psycholinguistics in the Netherlands and is also affiliated with the Hochschule Osnabrück. And uh, well, Christina Bergman has investigated, is investigating the development of language in infants, how their day-to-day -day experience influences their language, their, their um, learning uh, of language, the trajectory of learning. And she also uses uh, computational and modeling strategies to simulate and understand learning in infants. And third, and important for today's uh, um, talk for, uh, open science. She's also uh, one of the, the her important uh, lines of research concerns the uh, meta linguistic tools to aggregate existing evidence. And uh, the object of this third line of research is to produce more robust evidence and hence more robust theories. Uh, relatedly, Christina is a member of the governing board of uh, Many Babies. Many Babies uh, is an important international collaborative, pro collaborative project involving laboratories around the world for the replication of uh, influential experiments in the developmental psychology and also uh, for the development of uh, best practices uh, in uh, uh, developmental psychology research. Um, as usual, I want to keep it short, and so uh, I'll uh, give the floor to Christina for her presentation. Thank you very much for the invitation and the very nice introduction. Um, now I lost my rights to, to share my screen, apparently. Sorry, we tested that before, but um, Zoom was being a bit painful, so we need to quickly <laughs> fix this. Okay. Um, Can you try again right now? Yeah. Maybe I needed to stop sharing the initial yes, slide. Very possible. Great. Now we have everything's working, and I will share my slides in a second. So nice to see you all. Thanks for coming. And I am not seeing what I should be seeing. So I need to do this again. So I will be happy to share these slides. Um, 
afterwards as a PDF or a document um, that you want. Um, so just let me know what you need. Um, if you need the slides right now, um, speak up and I will quickly try to email them to you. Um, and I would like to make this very interactive. So I know there is time at the end for questions, but it would be great if you could um, either write something in the chat or just quickly unmute yourself and say, hey, sorry, I, I didn't catch you here or I would like to know more about this because I want you to get as much uh, as possible out of this presentation and not just me talking to you. Um, so really this is for you and to make the most of it. Um, yeah, I need your help. So this is the housekeeping bit. Um, yes, I. so this, this is how to reach me as well. Um, I'm doubly affiliated. Um, Hochschule Osnabrück um, means nothing else than Osnabrück University of Applied Sciences. I used the short one when, when handing in my affiliations, but we do have an English name. So I'm actually sitting in, in Germany right now. And you can reach me via my Gmail address. And I thought, especially for the PhD students, it would be really interesting and I need to, to quickly tell you um, how I got to this point. So I did my PhD. Um, yeah, I added years, so you can see it was some time ago um, in the Netherlands at Radboud University in Nijmegen, and there I built uh, computational models of early language acquisition, so that was really more technical. I was also affiliated to the local baby lab, so there was a lot of interdisciplinarity going on from the start. And my next step was going to Paris um, for my first postdoc or series of postdocs because Three years is enough time for multiple contracts and grants. Um, so if you want to know more about that, um, I got um, a fellowship at Ecole Normale Supérieure and then a Marie Curie um, um, ERC from the ERC, from the European uh, Union um, to, to fund that stay. Afterwards, I got a job at the Max Planck Institute for Psycholinguistics at the Language Development Department. That is the same place um, as my PhD. So it's both in the Netherlands and Nijmegen. But it's a different institution. So I did switch institutions, but I did circle back. Um, and uh, there I was uh, first a postdoc, then got promoted to senior investigator and lead of the innovations team. And since, uh, yeah, one month now and, and a bit, I uh, moved to Osnabrück to the University of Applied Sciences and am probably pretty unique in my role as recruiting professors. Uh, for their role, uh, for the role here at the University of Applied Sciences. And um, that is all relevant because at all stages, um, I got involved in different um, practices related to open science and reproducibility. So during my PhD, I got already really interested in sharing data and open materials because um, I got, yeah, I heard about the reproducibility crisis, um, which, which was happening right when my PhD was taking place as well. So it was a hot topic. Um, we also in the Netherlands had a, a big scandal. Um, the researcher who um, made up all his data, Stapel, was really just one town over. And the commission was led by Max Planck Institute founder, Pem Lefeld. So we actually got a really close look as PhD students uh, onto that investigation because um, yeah, I was also in the graduate school of the Max Planck Institute. So yeah, I did circle back a bit. Um, so um, I heard a lot about these issues and I got really, really eager to share my data, to, to, to sh uh, share my materials. Um, later also got interested in pre-registration, but it was difficult to see for modeling. It was only discussed in the beginning for experimental studies. So that wasn't really happening back then, historically. Um, and then during my postdoc already in 2014, 2015, I got involved in, or I co-founded MetaLab, and I got involved in many babies from the early stages on. And that both of these um, yeah, involvements or, or really having, having leading roles in both projects, which I will explain in a bit, actually led in parts to be me being um, yeah, hired at the Max Planck Institute and becoming leader of the innovations team, because both are innovations in the way we do science. So um, that was really, a really smart career move. And the things I've been doing there and the, the emphasis I have been placing on different aspects um, actually also led to my current uh, job, which I will 
explain in more detail in the end of the presentation, but um, yeah, you will, I hope you will see at the end how we got to this, this really interesting position of being an academic recruiter um, for professors uh, of applied sciences. But first I wanna share my vision of open scholarship to really lay a foundation and ensure that we all understand each other. So I'm not saying open science, this, uh, but I'm saying open scholarship. And this is an umbrella that actually has a lot of uh, things that I've been doing and I've been mentioning. So for example, open data, open materials, open source, um, but also community science, uh, open access publications, and really importantly, equity, diversity, and inclusion. And um, that directly leads me to I think the main theme of my work, namely opening science for broader collaboration and participation. Um, I should have put participation on there. Um, so this is really the theme that has been, um, yeah, at the core of my work, um, in addition to, of course, the scientific questions I've been asking, namely how do babies actually get words in their head? Um, it's, it's a mystery if you've ever seen a baby um, and if you ever listen to a foreign language, but um, yeah. Circling back to the other part of my work and this really big emphasis, making science open is more than sharing data and more than pre-registering. So how do we, yeah, how do we get to do that? Um, I wanted to explain the two initiatives that I've been part of and I will start with MetaLab. This is um, our logo <laughs> and it basically starts from the idea that a single study um, or from the observation that a single study, or in this case, um, a really influential uh, double study, so there's their self-replication in there, it's been published high impact, it's been cited a lot, leads to textbooks claiming things, like, for example, um, yeah, these two studies were significant, uh, in both uh, cases, the babies did what the eight-month-old infants, tiny, tiny babies, did um, something interesting, and showed a behavioral difference. So we can infer that the ability and investigation is in place around that time. So this, this arrow points neatly at eight, uh, eight months. This is problematic for a lot of reasons. Uh, one is if you have actually looked deeper into null hypothesis significant testing is that a single study is not enough. I would want to quickly throw in that the same probably holds for Bayesian studies. Um, but I'm not an expert, but just changing the paradigm is not the answer here. It's just my, my, my comment that I want to make and emphasize here. Um, this is just a reminder that if you simulate studies and the average, um, the population average, this dashed line here is zero, and you just simulate studies with, uh, say, 20 participants, which is a pretty common sample size, right? Um, then you will always have significant results and no two studies will give you exactly the same numeric results. So the blue dots are the averages and the um, bars are the 95% confidence intervals. Um, so you see how it judges around the sample. I mean, you can really play with this uh, wonderful uh, demonstration on the R Psychologist website. I want to strongly recommend it to, for you to get a feel for all these different uh, statistical concepts. It's an incredible tool that I keep going back to, um, not just for, for our talks, but also just for my own understanding. And it really highlights how you never know whether the study you're looking at is this little outlier here or this perfect representation of the sample or near perfect representation of the sample. Um, you can't, you just can't conclude it. We don't have any tools to, to infer that. Um, we just have tools to try to make studies a bit more robust. Um, but since a single study is not enough, we got the tool of meta-analyses. Meta-analyses are almost as old as p-values. So p-values were introduced and quickly after people said, okay, we need to actually deal with this fact that p-values um, have this long view on studies, not just a single, single sample, but really sampling over probabilities over time or over, over multiple studies. So what a meta-analysis does is nothing else than taking all the studies that have been conducted on a specific topic and aggregate them. It's really running a, a 
a variant of a, a regression on the data points. So you can take studies that actually went into the opposite direction where people concluded, well, actually they're not really doing what you think they're doing. They're doing something completely different and you can take studies that show no results and studies that show stronger evidence and see over all of these different studies that might have used different stimuli that might have had a slightly different setup, a slightly different design um, and uh, have varied along many, many dimensions. This is what we see on average. This is how robust across the existing evidence our results are. And what we do on MetaLab is go a bit beyond that. <clears throat> Sorry. Yeah. And actually share the data that go into these kinds of meta-analyses and um, make them yeah, downloadable, but also give you the um, ability to look at different, what we call moderators. So this, for example, is um, the plot you, or the, the data you just saw a bit richer by age. So you can put in a, a age as a moderator and see whether there is an age effect. In this particular case, there is no age effect, but the story here is of course more complicated. But just to show you that you can look further and, and start investigating different dimensions because studies do differ on multiple dimensions. Most studies do um, use different stimuli that might differ systematically or they have um, yeah, other interesting features that differ that only an expert can even think of as possibly relevant and then identify as a potential moderator and put in a meta-analysis. So what ingredients do we need for a meta-analysis? And the key is open data. And um, I just want to mention that these data need to be well curated, documented, and sort of complete, which is harder than it seems. I'm pretty sure you've heard the story already. I just want to remind you open data is for more than checking whether your conclusions hold when someone else runs the analysis. It's also key for yeah, collaborating across space and time. Um, so you need to support open data because a meta-analysis is nothing else than a post-hoc collaboration. It's all the labs that have contributed data or, or collected data contributing to a single analysis. And that I think is pretty powerful and pretty amazing. Um, so I just wanna call for support well-documented and well-curated open data. Um, so meta-analyses are one way of getting uh, information together and they rely on studies having been conducted, more than one study having been conducted, some replication having taken place, maybe replication with additional questions. But the, the problem there is that not everything has been systematically replicated. Actually, most things in infant research haven't. And um, it also will, yeah, is usually based on a very skewed sample. We have uh, different kinds of pr pressures that apply to, to the available record from age. Older data are harder to get because they might be in formats that we can no longer access. That's why um, sharing data in open source formats is really, really important. Um, don't put things out there in yeah, an SPSS format, please. <laughs> use use uh, CSVs or, or tab separated values. Um, that's my personal experience that this can get really tricky really quickly. So um, I do have data files uh, somewhere from a collaborator who no one can, which no one can open. Um, it was a very common program 20 years ago, but no one predicted that it would go out of fashion. So we need um, to think about these things. But yeah, so um, studies haven't necessarily been conducted on the phenomenon of interest, or they might vary in important ways that you think introduce noise, for example. Yeah, you could come up with, with various scenarios like that um, all studies that you conduct on face perception also have some sound. And you really don't want the sound to, to muddle with your effect. Or most studies on face perception are actually EEG studies. And you actually want a behavior measure, a behavior response, say pupil dilation. Um, and so meta-analysis is, is really just limited to what has been conducted. Another pressure that is applied to the existing evidence is publication bias, right? We all know about it being much, much easier till this day to publish significant results and surprising results. So there's this very 
well-founded expectation that any evidence we find will be skewed in a particular direction. In infant research, we are lucky enough that the data are so hard to collect that people are really, really eager to publish them. And um, that usually any kind of behavior is interesting. <laughs> so um, usually when you look for publication bias in, in infant studies, it's actually way less severe than, than these very extreme samples where you, where you basically can, can draw the line between significant and non-significant. And only things that are just above the significance threshold are published and, and everything else is, is mysteriously missing, even though a uh, random chance predicts it should be there. Because as I showed in the graph earlier, random chance alone will make studies not significant. Um, and yeah, if you, if, if you want to talk more about power and um, type one and type two error and all these things, then we can do that. So just let me know. Sorry, I have a little frog. At least in German, we say we have a little frog in, in uh, our throat. <clears throat> See some, some linguistic fun on the side. So how can we um, address the fact that meta-analyses are not enough? Well, that's where large-scale collaborations come into play. And I've been involved in many babies, which is a particular kind of large-scale collaboration. So I want to highlight the website. And we also have a nice logo, just like MetaLab, <laughs> um, where you can get a lot more information than what I will be telling you. Um, so it's a consortium of infant researchers at all career stages. And it includes people who might not, as their main mission, have infant research. So you can yeah, just be interested in infant research and still join many babies. And the vision of many babies is to be what we call radically collaborative and have a horizontal framework, which means everyone can lead and contribute. It's not that um, I, as a member of the governing board, will be the one determining who leads projects, what kind of uh, questions get asked, etc. So it's really trying to be as grassroots as possible. Um, we conduct large-scale conceptual consensus-based replications of seminal findings. And this consensus-based is really important. So these are not like what you have might have seen in the many lab uh, studies, taking a specific publication, looking as closely as you can, maybe even contacting the authors to um, extract what they have been doing. So for example, in the example earlier, I could talk to, to the lead authors, uh, get their stimuli, ideally get their setup, and then just run a large scale replication. Um, in most cases, when you look at these seminal, seminal studies and talk to the authors, the authors themselves think, oh, that might not actually have been the best test of the phenomenon. So uh, I know that the study I mentioned earlier, the author says, actually, it would be much cooler if we use this kind of stimuli across most studies and most replications than that kind of stimuli. And um, she has published herself uh, showing that it works with her. Uh, more natural kind of stimuli too. So that's really nice. But it shows that, um, yeah, even the authors of seminal works usually don't think that their seminal work is, it should be that seminal or should be the one piece of evidence that we usually cite. The other thing is that we of course have um, constantly evolving um, methodological tools. So in infant research, 20, 30, 30 now years ago, we have the 2020s already, Oof. Um, 30 years ago. So you might have shown babies images on a television, like a really nice deep television, you know, these, these boxes. I don't know whether you have ever experienced them. I grew up with these nice boxy things. And now we do not only have very nice mobile flat screens, but we also have eye trackers. And uh, that is of course a quantum leap. And, the kind of data we can get. And the next uh, steps that are already in progress are instead of hand coding, using automatic gaze detection. So people are actively working on that. Instead of uh, inviting babies to the lab by running studies online, people are doing great stuff with that. So I'm happy to tell you more about all of these different lines of innovation, if you're curious. Um, I just want to mention that there's constant innovation. So of course, the best test will also change with time. Um, because we might think, okay, we used to use button presses, but maybe actually skin conductance 
is a much better test of certain, say, emotional studies or emotional questions. Um, so that's why it's important to, to run conceptual consensus-based replications. And maybe there is a single study that is the best test already and that will be replicated in many babies. The consensus also involves if there are different camps try, or tries to involve people from, diff from these different camps. So when there, for example, um, is one party saying, actually, I don't believe in this effect. And another party says, actually, that effect is pretty robust. I've been able to replicate it 20 times. Then the dream is to get them all on one table and to really get them to talk to each other and uh, try to find a, a way how they can dissolve this dis disagreement. Um, so what kind of study would actually convince you one way or the other? And that is, of course, extremely powerful. The um, idea of many babies also gives you the, or the, the scale of many babies gives you the power to identify sources of variability. Um, there is a bit of that already in meta-analyses. What I did with age, for example, is age in infant studies is a source of variability. Um, so we often actually make, um, yeah, hypotheses about when abilities emerge. But it also um, gives you, yeah, uh, boundaries. So it also says, okay, if we run this study instead of in this way, using completely like, say, if we do, do something that you would normally test with faces with completely artificial stimuli that only have eyes, does this still hold? And that gives you really nice boundaries for theorizing. Because usually you try in your verbal theories to be as general as possible, whereas your evidence is super specific. And that creates an interesting tension that you can only just uh, resolve with data. And based on the consensus-based replications and the way we conduct our studies, um, we're able to develop best practices in infant studies. So what would be great if, if most people did it that way? And uh, final vision is that we increase the diversity of research populations and research questions. And each of these is important. So this is, if you think back to the umbrella I showed earlier, right? This is diversity, equity, and inclusion right there. So we want more, yeah, we want more researchers from different places, from different backgrounds, from different schools of thought. Um, of course, we want uh, more diverse populations. Um, this is, um, I hope this goes without saying for psychologists, right, that if we, um, if I generate a theory and test it only with German babies and say, okay, um, when a German baby hears the word uh, Milch, it starts uh, getting really, really excited. And I claim, well, all babies get really excited when they hear the word milk, um, then that will, of course, not generalize to Italian babies, um, I would assume. <laughs> so um, I assume that, that there it's maybe, I hope latte is the correct term for that you would also use with babies, um, that you would, would see that effect there. So um, of course, diversity also opens our eyes again to um, boundaries and more robust theorizing um, and more diverse research questions because our own view on the world and our experiences shape what we think is interesting. So we need to open our, our yeah, view to, to new perspectives and thus new research questions that in different contexts might, might be much more important than the questions we are thinking are key to solving the issues of our time. And I want to make sure that no one has questions. I'm really surprised. I don't see anything in the chat or so. Um, <laughs> so seems good. Everyone seems happy. We have just one comment from a person that would love to talk more about statistical power. Mm. Uh, we were waiting for <laughs> to actually give it more space in the in the actual question at the end, but. Yeah, if we can, yeah, we can do that in the, in the end and maybe we can talk. I think I'll have one more graph that will be fun to look at um, and think about power. But yeah, I will, I will keep that in mind. That's great. Thanks for these kinds of requests. That's fantastic. So um, 
what is the status quo? This is really important, of course, to know. Um, this is for language uh, acquisition um, research and child language acquisition research. This is a recent preprint from the Max Planck Institute, so I'm shamelessly plugging it, um, where they tracked um, which languages people study when they study child language acquisition between 1974 and 2020. So this is the graph there. And the green bits on top are all dialects of English, usually mostly American English. Um, that's just English. <laughs> that's not representative of the 7,000 something languages we speak in the world. It's, it's actually also really not a representative language in itself. That's, yeah, English is not, is not actually a good example of a language in some ways. Um, the orange bits are then other Indo-European languages, which are of course related to English and the purple bit that you see well emerging in the 90s um, are non-Indo-European languages. So that will be uh, Mandarin, Japanese, etc. Um, yeah, so talking about diversity, there is not much. And um, who's doing these kinds of studies? These are the just this is the distribution of uh, regions of affiliation of the authors who published the articles. And um, actually, it nicely tracked. So it's not like people just all go to study English, which is actually what I did in my PhD. I had the, the clearest stimuli and the best data sets for English. So actually, my whole PhD thesis is on English. Um, but that was a pure um, pragmatic decision. And, and still, English has the best data available. Um, but it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's also people not, not publishing from, from regions outside of Europe or North America. And that doesn't mean that there is no language acquisition research happening there. So you, this is only what is visible, what reaches us. And so that really shows the big discrepancy between how the world is populated and where people are doing probably very interesting work and what we are looking at. So our view is really, really biased. And I just want to hammer that home and, and really make sure that, that we know that. And there are similar studies for other aspects of psychology. So there's, of course, the, the seminal weird paper that introduces the term, um, the Western educated, industrialized, rich and democratic standard participant. I would go one step further because this, this describes uh, global demographics that even within a country, we have a highly skewed sample towards high education, mostly urban settings because labs are in urban settings or in, in university towns. Um, and um, so we have an even further skewed sample. And that's probably true for most of psychology. But well, so many babies has work to do. And uh, this is really just to justify why this, these, all of these goals are really, really important. Um, so I thought I'd give you a quick overview of the current status of many babies projects. Um, they are all on the website, um, so you can find out more about those. And right now there are five, what we call num sorry, <laughs> numbered projects. My little frog is, is acting up again. And two methodological projects. Um, there is a, a third project that sits in between method and, and empirical. So I didn't really know how to mention it, but I'll verbally bring it up. So the first Mini Babies project, and that's the one I will talk most about because it's completed, was about do babies prefer infant over adult directed speech? Do they like how we talk to babies more? So is that, um, is that increased attention that we often presume that also probably drives parents talking in a funny way to their children? Um, is that something that is really robust and um, yeah, global? Because um, that's pretty foundational for infant research because we, we tend to record our stimuli in this nice infant-directed speech. If you're not sure what I'm talking about, um, think about how you would talk either to a baby or if you don't, don't like babies to a, a puppy or a kitty because actually puppy or, or kitten-directed speech is pretty, pretty similar. So just, just imagine cute little Labrador baby and, and yeah, you, you already noticed that my voice changed. Um, so there's this change and babies do prefer it. To give you a quick spoiler, so first Many Babies project was a success. Um, the next one 
is a really interesting topic. Um, it's on theory of mind in infancy. So babies, uh, theory of mind means, um, for those of you who aren't uh, in, I, I guess most of you know what I mean, but I'll still try to explain it and correct me if I'm wrong, theory of mind researchers in the room. Um, it's about theory of mind in general. Is this um, idea that you can reason or have a theory about other people's minds. So you can reason about unobservable states in other people's heads. Like I just did about reason about you, some of you knowing more about theory of mind than I do. Um, this is usually done with knowledge states um, in childhood. So for example, um, if I see my friend walk over there, I assume my friend is staying over there even though I can't see them any longer. And if I don't observe them leaving the house that they walked into, I will continue to assume that. So if a third observer knows that the friend left the house through the back door, they can't ascribe that knowledge to me. That's, that's basically the idea of theory of mind. And um, there are studies showing this kind of reasoning already in infancy, so really, really early in, in tiny, tiny babies. <laughs> and um, this is, yeah, of course, really tricky to show because you can't just ask them, where do you think uh, the teddy bear's friend is hiding? Right, they, they don't even have the verbal capabilities yet to, to say, I do know or I don't know. Um, the third one is about rule learning. Um, so when babies hear sequences, in this case of sounds, can they extract patterns? So for example, if they always hear um, an ABB pattern, so a repetition, do they notice that this is the abstract pattern? So when they hear new sounds, they follow the same pattern, do they recognize the pattern itself? So going a, a bit more abstract. Um, the fourth one is on social evaluation. If you see small guys or a small guy, a small circle trying to go up a hill and there's a triangle that pushes him down and a square that helps him up, will you show a preference for the square over the triangle, for the helper over the hindra? And that's called social evaluation that's been used to reason um, that babies have very early foundational moral um, thinking. And the fifth one uh, is uh, about the so-called Hunter and Ames model, which um, has a very clear prediction of when babies prefer something they already know uh, and when they go for something they don't know yet. So familiarity versus novelty exploitation versus exploration. Um, I am part of the leading team of Many Babies Five. And um, I did or do participate in Many Babies Three, but uh, I can't tell you as much about two and four. As for the methodological projects, Many Babies at Home was really born in the pandemic because um, we all had to close our baby labs and we, we saw that there are already great efforts out there uh, on testing babies at home um, via webcams. So yeah, right, we're all now doing things via Zoom. So why shouldn't we test babies that way? And um, so we started that project um, and yeah, got a huge crowd of researchers together, but it's been really slow because there are a lot of infrastructural hurdles to take with global online data collection. We even wrote a paper about it because it's been so tricky. But there is progress and the first project that is about visual preference is uh, in the piloting stage and the second project, which is about word recognition, it's really a topic very close to my heart, is in the design phase and moving towards the registered reports. Oh yeah, RR stands for registered report, by the way. So um, if you don't know what a registered report is, let me know and I will explain that as well. <laughs> um, and there's also many, many babies demographics because we want to ideally be able to say how representative of the global population and the local population our samples are. And it would be fantastic if we could use just one standard questionnaire asking for demographic information like age and whether babies were born early or on time and all of these things. Turns out there is no single way to ask most of these questions. So age, okay, in most contexts, people do track birth dates, but even that is not universal. So you can't just assume that every culture and every country tracks the date of birth or 
um, the weeks at which babies were born and when they start counting, whether they count from conception or from two weeks before, as, as we do here in, in Germany, for example. So this is tricky. <laughs> and then this doesn't even get us into the messy things like um, ethnicity and heritage. Um, so do people perceive themselves as white uh, or their babies as white as their baby? Do we even have a concept of white? Is the concept of, of whiteness the same globally? These are really, really, really thorny issues. And that's why we needed many babies demographics. So it's really been born out of a need that, that appeared within many babies. And um, I'm actually amazed at cross-cultural psychology for adults um, because I, I don't see this issue discussed a lot. <laughs> so maybe if you have done cross-cultural research, I would love to hear from you how you solve these kinds of questions. Um, and then the, the one I mentioned that is kind of in between empirical and methodological is a mix of many babies to theory of mind and infancy and many babies at home. So it's an online spin-off of many babies too. So it's both a methodological comparison between online data and lab data, which is not part of many babies at home. And uh, it's, it's again a test of theory of mind and infancy. And that's really exciting, actually. Having these nice paired data sets um, is another big, big um, opportunity we get with many babies. And um, yeah, this is constantly in flux. I want to tell you now how a single project proceeds. And I want to give you um, the example of many babies one because that's completed. But um, note that this is not necessarily representative for two reasons. One is this was the first Many Babies project, so we were figuring things out. Um, really, it was, yeah, how do we, how do we even do this? Can we even do this? Was basically the, the, the underlying first question was, can we even have this kind of large scale collaboration and a many labs kind of study for infant research? Um, so a lot of things, a lot of infrastructure, et cetera, was, was actually being built with many babies one. The other projects will also not be representative because of obvious reasons, the pandemic, right? That affected everything. But yeah, so just to give you an idea, and that's extremely relevant, of course, for PhD students, right? When can you expect a publication out of a large scale, large scale collaboration? And that does take time. So the, in this case, from the idea, to the actual official publication uh, five years. From data collection to um, accepted registered report stage two. So something you could actually cite on your CV or put on your CV or maybe even yeah, put on, on applications. Um, it was still two years. Um, so it's been quite, quite the journey. Um, but yeah, to, to go through it uh, step by step. So there was first an idea over, over conference um, and then uh, a call for participation that was, yeah, uttered more broadly, inviting people to discuss the, whether we can even do this in infant research. And um, the topic was then decided in January. And then things moved pretty quickly to piloting in September and a first submission of a registered report in December. In parallel, we wrote, the, we wrote down the idea of this kind of approach, what we call the theory paper. So there's a paper now describing why we think many babies is necessary. So that's, that's another output, that, but that's not a given, of course. But that's actually really nice to, to go back to and think, okay, what, what was the actual intention? Um, data collection then started in 2017 and went on to 2018. We gave labs a whole year because recruiting infants is really hard. And um, data collection was basically limited by us presenting uh, the first results in July at a big conference and crunching <laughs> towards uh, this, this presentation because there was a lot of data cleaning to be done, etc. I'm happy to tell you more about that aspect as well. This is like the nitty -bitty, bitty details of large scale collaborations, but basically have a lot of people working on data and standardize, standardize, standardize. This goes also back to the open data documentation and curation issue I brought up earlier. So data is just really hard. <laughs> That's the, the bottom line. And 
what did we actually do? So we did have a huge sample. The goal was 20 labs. And in the end, we had 69 labs submitting data from 2,754 babies that were tested in labs or invited in labs. Um, after all exclusions were applied that we had pre-registered, um, we ended up with a sample of 2,329 infants. This is 100 times bigger than the average infant study. Right, it's two orders of magnitude, it's not one. We thought, okay, 200 babies, that would be amazing. Um, so this was on, on the sampling side a resounding success, I would say. But if you look at the geo geogra geography of many babies, I can't speak anymore. <laughs> Um, you see that it's clustered again in North America. So think back to the graph I showed earlier on, on what kind of babies we study. We're replicating that a bit. We, we are a bit more global. So we do have uh, labs here in Asia. We do have uh, Australia, Europe, and here Turkey, but both South America and Africa are completely blank. And just wanna highlight that this is something that we really are actively addressing. Just quickly, because you might be interested, what did we find? And there is an overall effect, as I spoiled it already earlier, but it's much smaller than the meta-analysis on the same topic. And there's an ongoing effort to compare these data more directly. So not just look at the summary statistics, but really try to throw them all on the same model. Um, now, this is the, the fun thing. And this is the graph I was thinking of when I said, I will tell you something more about power because many babies won is of course hugely overpowered, right? It's, it's extremely high powered because we have so many babies. If you, if you just look at the main effect, uh, it could have detected effects much, much smaller than this. Um, but then when you look back at the single labs, um, not every lab has, has run a high powered study in it individually. So if all of these labs have published their single results, um, the picture on whether or not the effect is real would be much less clear. Um, yeah, and some labs even went a bit in the opposite direction. So again, this, this directionality of an effect is an interesting point. So this really is very reminiscent of this 95% confidence interval graph I showed earlier. And it shows exactly the same effect. It shows a few other things like sample size, age effects, and, and method effects, but I'm not going to, into them in detail. You can read the paper or <laughs> um, yeah, talk to me at another time. I want to highlight though the different project outputs um, in addition to the paper. So there's the, this is a register report uh, by the Many Babies Con Consortium. It has all the badges, of course. <laughs> um, and yeah, it, if you, you should be able to find it also accessible. Um, there is an open science framework um, project where you can find a lot of information. You can find the stimuli and the attention getter. You can find the procedure instructions and yeah, a lot more information, how we norm the stimuli, et cetera. And you can also find the data on this public um, GitHub account and you can just uh, download them. And you see here, I actually was the last one to edit them <laughs> um, by adding the reference of the final published paper with the DOI, et cetera. Um, so this, hopefully this repository um, and this project both serve as best practice for sharing data, making them open, et cetera. I also quickly want to highlight that there is much more going on uh, than a, a single big paper. And this means there are much more opportunities because um, in parallel to this main study, there was also the idea to recruit uh, a special population named actually the bigger population bilingual babies. More people speak two languages than one. So that makes sense. Still language acquisition research really strongly relies on people who are learning one language at the same time and only later in life might learn a second one like me learning English at school. And this bilingualism study was also published as a registered report and had to, um, because it was tied to, to many babies, one had a very similar timeline. But there are many more spin-offs. So I just really give, want to give you an idea of the breadth of, of um, what you can do around a single big numbered project. Um, so there's there was a gaze following um, study that compared monolingual and bilingual babies. There was a test retest reliability paper where the same babies were invited back into the lab. And actually, 
um, that led to another paper with the lead uh, or with or not with the lead with with someone who was also very interested in that that we wrote together about reliability in infant studies in general so that was very very productive for me um and this whole test we test reliability thing is, is something that's completely undervalued in infant research and maybe in psychology at large so i want to strongly recommend looking up what that means and what that involves there is a longitudinal follow-up how babies who show specific behaviors might differ in their language learning trajectories and there is the comparison with meta-analysis data I mentioned. And there is a specific project that extends the sample to Africa and that um, extends the stimuli. So how can you contribute to a Many Babies project to just quickly rush on because I'm looking at the time. Um, you can be a contributor or a lead. And as a contributor, you can support big projects or spin-offs. Um, by signing up, you commit to the core values and code of conduct and you get you, you're basically instantly part of a very supportive community. You're learning different open science practices with a safety net and you have a lot of opportunity for growth. So you can also first see, okay, how are other people taking on the analysis in the pre-registration phase? How do they run power analyses? And then you can maybe become one of the leads of the analysis effort in this uh, analysis phase of the real data. Um, and you can also lead projects. So you can propose a topic or a spin-off and then coordinate. And there's actually, I hope, really good instructions on the website how to get involved. So, and you don't need to have access to infant and infants labs. This is this is really a common misconception in, in all of these large scale collaborations. I did harp a bit on data analysis because that's really one of the key skills along with coordination and uh, documentation. These are key aspects of these large scale collaborations that do not need access to infant data. So you can be a productive member of a large scale collaboration without really being, um, yeah, collecting data. So this is just really how you do it. So how do things look right now with our active efforts to improve representation? I think it does look a bit better. There's this really nice interactive dashboard where you can um, zoom in. I just really did the global screenshot. And you see right now it looks much better than before, right? We don't have these huge blind spots, but for example, South America does need a bit more attention. So what are our ongoing challenges and challenges I think that we share with other large scale collaborations? Um, diversity, um, leadership and contribution is still biased towards rich, rich institutions and rich countries. Ethics, um, how do we deal with data sharing in a consortium? How do we deal with the fact that we test participants who cannot give informed consent, um, namely the babies? Um, and how do we deal with their video recordings, their demographics and health data, for example, whether they were premature, et cetera, and their responses? Um, and how do we fund the whole thing? It's really, yeah, an ongoing uh, struggle to get this, this kind of effort funded. So going back to my CV, I hope now you see how um, there's this, this line of, of um, yeah, being, um, going from being interested in open data and open materials towards, um, yeah, helping run large scale collaborations and, and projects. And in my current position as academic recruiter to explain this a bit more, I'm taking this idea of open science again, to the academic job market. So it's not just who can do science in a large scale collaborations, but also who can become a professor. Because if you look at, yeah, the current professorate, um, I think everywhere, it's heavily biased to a very small demographic. And one of my goals right now is to improve that state of affairs and um, get people convinced that they can, they too can become a professor, in my case, at a University of Applied Sciences, which means there's a closer link to industry and it's one of the paths back from industry into, into academia. Um, so you can and should double, explore, and learn, and then can take what you've learned back to the classroom here at this university. And that's, that's my mission right now. And I'm really, really excited about it. But because I know you're not all infant researchers, I did prepare a quick run in the last minute, I promise. 
um, of what else is out there. So I wanted to mention other large scale collaborations. Um, this is just a quick snatch, snapshot. Um, so there's, for example, many primates who yeah, do primate research, many dogs, many birds. I think there's also many cats right now, many classes, which is classroom research, many moments, which is about um, um, high intensity um, data collection with usually cell phones. So um, yeah, ESM research, if, if that's something for you, the psychological science accelerator and many, many more. Um, and I also want to mention other data, data accumulation efforts in addition to MetaLab and of course there's NeuroVault for the neuro um, researchers, Childers for Child Language Corpora, Word Bank and Peak Bank from the child uh, language community. And probably there's more that I don't even know about that might be super relevant, relevant for you. So keep your eyes open. And this is me, <laughs> this is the end. Thanks. So I will stop screen sharing if I can. And I think I need to run to my other screen for that. And um, yeah, please ask any questions. Otherwise I will talk about power <laughs> once my screen wakes up. Ah, there's uh, the chat. That's why I don't see it. We had one more question asked so far from Massimo, yeah, yeah. but I think you quite answered that uh, probably. Uh, I, can, I, can, I can also, I mean, while people make up their mind and think about questions, uh, first, may I ask a question? Like, can I go? I yes. know that students are, 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 should be the first, but there are no uh, there are no questions at the moment, so I go. Uh, first of all, Christina, thank you for the lovely talk. Uh, very interesting. But uh, did you, in this data set of uh, available data in the literature, did you analyze which is the modal number of uh, participants uh, in the classical studies that investigate babies? Or um, modal of the distribution, uh, which is yeah. the range of participants in, in a classical study that is investigating baby. So we did it not for the classical studies, which is actually an interesting question. Like um, the most cited, say, infant studies, how many participants do they have? I don't have that data, but I do have for all the meta analyses on MetaLab, which is um, at that point it was. Um, sorry, my. Am I still here? Yeah, <laughs> my, my, my PowerPoint was acting up. Uh, at that point it was 12 and now we're over 20. Um, at 12 meta-analyses and data from over 1000 infants, the uh, typical infant study included uh, 20 participants. So really this 20, I didn't, didn't, it didn't come out of nowhere. It's really the classical or the typical sample size that we observe. And um, it's interesting because this is not related to effect size or age. Um, yeah, in fact, um, this is, was my next question because I, I suspect that the type of effect that you are targeting is very small and therefore 20 looks like uh, really It's nothing. extremely underpowered, yeah. So typical yeah. power is like 50%. So you're basically rolling the dice on if there yeah. is an effect, whether you can actually observe it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, you're rolling dice it, there. It, you are rolling dice many times. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so that's, uh, that's the conclusion of the paper. I will just paste the link in the in the um, in the chat, and um, then you can read up on what we've done there and whether that's that probably warrants some follow up studies right now. I think that would be great if someone could follow up on that kind of work. Um, and plus, because I mean, I'm not an expert of baby studies, but I see that often because of the constraints you have for the how, how long you can keep the baby in the lab. You have several between studies designs. You cannot collect many measures with a single baby. And therefore, even the datum that one baby returns you is really noisy itself. Okay. Exactly. That's the other paper I mentioned that I will also put in the chat because why not? <laughs> uh, that discusses, I, I mean, I, most of my papers actually discuss the noise in infant data. <laughs> it's a theme because it's really, it's a really big issue, but um, yeah. So this, these are the two papers I promised. Um, and I see a question there. We so have quite a few more 
questions in the meantime? Yeah, that's great. I think we had one by Christina on asking about open science practices and whether you think they're taking into enough consideration in recruitment now, or yeah. if we could do something more about it. So um, it's it's a really tricky topic because the 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 insight that open science is a good thing and that being collaborative is a good thing has not is not shared by everyone. So that is an, a, an attitude issue that we have that people do not necessarily agree that open science per se is something useful. So it, it strongly depends on the context. Um, there are fantastic labs and fantastic employers, mostly in my experience, those tied to many babies who are extremely supportive of many baby uh, of, of open science practices and who might actually even officially put it as one criteria in their job uh, uh, ad advertisement. So this is actually something we see grow and that's being semi systematically tracked. There's an open science uh, repository, open science and, and job um, advertisements. Um, that's an effort led by Felix Schönbrot uh, from Munich, who tries to, to keep track of um, whether that's even mentioned, but we don't know how that's being evaluated. Um, both um, when it's explicitly mentioned as criterion, because of course, do people, how highly rank people, how highly do rank, do people rank it? What order is hard. <laughs> how highly do people rank it among all the criteria, like how much funding you got, uh, how many publications you have as first author, how many citations you have, whether you published in science and then, oh, you do open science as well. Oh, well, that's maybe a minor plus or so. Um, so would that move you from the from the definitely hireable to the not uh, or to the maybe hireable to the definitely hireable category or not? That's an open question. I don't know. I, I'm not sitting in these committees. I can't tell you. And the of course these kinds of deliberations aren't public knowledge. That's when we have the evidence that it's at least considered. But when it's not part of the criteria, we don't know what people do with this information. So it could go either way, right? So I'm, I'm, I don't know. I think we need a, um, I think it would be great if it were more common to, to, to agree that this is a, not a bad thing. Um, and that's it, basically that's me <laughs> as, as a very extreme open scientist, maybe. Um, yeah. So, that's my experience. I yeah, I did mention it in all my job applications. And yeah. <laughs> I mean, of course, I, I had to write. <laughs> it would be weird if not, like, where's why why is there a huge gap in your CV? Oh, I was doing many babies. <laughs> yeah. There is no gap though. <laughs> <laughs> you can always keep busy. Um, sorry, yeah. Um, so it's, it's I don't know. Uh uh, I see, Christina, that there is a, uh, a question by Caterina Vannucci. Yes. Uh, I read it aloud, which is, in your opinion, are there some key good practices for dealing with many colleagues and coordinating the work in multiple studies across different labs? How to make the best group decision, managing conflicts, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, I could add because I think suggestions that's... on how, on how yeah. to deal with many. Yeah, the many part. Um, and not the many babies part, but the many collaborators. Um, I think this is a fantastic question. I must say with many babies, we've been extremely lucky to have collaborators who are all on the same page in terms of um, the values, but we did formalize a few of these values with a code of conduct and, and some shared responsibilities, et cetera, some shared um, yeah, ideas of how to deal with this kind of collaboration that we, yeah, stay, of course, respectful, these, these implicit things that we formalize them, but also how to deal with, um, if you're part of the analysis team, how to deal with the fact that you have early access to data that um, shouldn't be shared. <laughs> so so there's a lot of, um, there are a lot of things that, that can go wrong and there's always dissent. I mean, I was, in many babies, one, I was one of the people advocating for a completely different design. I had a completely different idea about how this should be done. And I was very, very uh, adamant about it. And I needed some convincing and um, actually only came around after the results were in my, I must admit. Um, so sometimes you need um, 
respectful but firm leadership so you, you do need leads you, you can't be completely grassroots there needs to be someone appointed decision maker and responsible for moving things forward because things otherwise fall asleep or fall apart um, so there needs to be competent leadership basically and that's that's really hard being a competent respectful open um leader is is as a skill that I wish I could I could train people in because then that would be so much easier. Um, but yeah, it's yeah, it's really it's a really interesting balance you have to strike. And especially when there is conflict, um, you will not be able to solve everything. Especially in these consensus-based design processes, right? You need to. There will always be people who do not um, have all their wishes um, met, basically. And so, how do you deal with that? Um, and my observation is that as long as you stay respectful and say, I hear you, but for pragmatic reasons or because the majority goes that way, we will do X. So you need to always be able to, to convince people. I mean, we're all scientists, right? We should be convinced by a good argument. Um, yeah, but we're also human, so we, we might be stubborn. <laughs> so it's, it's, yeah, it's tricky, but I think being respectful and, and listening to each other is, is one of the, are the key components to, to, to this. And luck. I think there's luck because you can always have this, this one collaborator who basically derails everything and puts a wrench in every decision that can happen. Um, so yeah, I, I don't want to, to, to discount luck actually. But it's a great question. Yeah. Uh, I don't hear you. Uh, any, uh, I carry on on this very question. Sorry, <laughs> yeah. I've got many questions of you, but I don't see any other question in the chat. Uh, the only which other is... one was the, the power. Okay. Uh, uh, oh, yes, the power uh, issue. Uh, but if you want oh, to continue yeah. on that line, I saw that Christina unmuted. Uh, I just mentioned it again to yeah. make sure we, yeah. we don't forget about it. No, that's good. Uh, okay, okay, okay. Okay, so sorry, sorry. Christina, please interrupt me. So we go back to power. Yeah, or we can, if, if you have questions related to this issue, then and we can, but yeah, I can. I think we, we can stick to this issue now that we're talking about it. I just wanted to make sure yeah. that we save exactly. a little bit of time for that, since it was the first question that was asked. No, exactly. And, and I think power is really, really interesting. <laughs> now, I wanted just to add one a little comment on this. Uh, um, so far, was the many baby more democratic or more uh, vertically uh, um, driven by a, a small group of people? So um, I think the first one was extremely democratic because everyone who had heard about it and had signed up for participating actually got to vote on the first study topic. Um, but of course, since then we needed a different process to to propose topics. So now we have. Um, people proposing uh, yeah, specific topics and we, we've developed a form because we had to, to formalize things a bit more. And um, we give feedback and so far we haven't re rejected um, a topic, but these topics are of course not chosen by a large group, but by a few people who think I could lead this kind of project, which, which ties in with what I just commented about leadership and, and the need for, for leadership and, and people feeling responsible and moving things forward. So. Um, but then we try to make sure that within the project, the further decisions are made as democratically as possible within reason, right? Again, if you if you open the forum for everything um, and, and don't don't set a hard stop to, to discussions about topic X, then it will go on forever by the nature of science and, and the kinds of studies we are not being completely 100% decisive or not often not being one right way to do things so that's um yeah that's that's how it goes but i would say they are just as democratic as democratic as possible and the studies i've been part of really weren't very top down so it's not like there's one person saying okay this is how i think we should test this and i just need as many people as possible collecting data for me so this is not really the approach that we're taking within many babies. And it's also not the philosophy. So, so people will not really be interested in many babies if they try to do that. And they can still do it, right? They just don't get the many babies label. So 
it's not it's not like it's forbidden or anything it's just not called many babies then i hope that helps but yeah so far i would say it's really democratic but yeah we can quickly run back to power if you want oh sorry I'm... okay um... Opened the wrong link. I don't know whether Irene is still here. Uh, she wants to ask the yeah, uh, Irene, question you... di directly. You I see here? her here, uh, but I don't know whether she's responsive. <laughs> because uh, I, I would yeah, love to. Her. Yeah, because I, I actually she didn't write a specific question. Yeah, which is great. Um, so just a quick definition, power is um, the probability to observe an effect with a significant p-value, assuming that the effect is really present in the population you're sampling from. So in our case, for example, infant directed speech preference. Um, and um, yeah, so so if, you, if you're underpowered, right, the less power you have, the more likely you are you observe a null result. So it's a, usually it's, and, and power is, is can be calculated from standard, in a standard way from three things. One is the effect size you can observe. Uh, two is the sample size. And three is, is yeah, your significance threshold. And I think, and then of course, the, the kind of statistical test you're doing. So power is closely tied to the statistics you want to run. Power for a linear mixed model is completely different from power for a t-test. Um, just want to make that right. You can't just say, oh, we're high powered, period. No, we're high powered for this specific t-test. Um, so, but then if you if you have all these these numbers or all these all this information, you can get at a percentage. Um, yeah, for t-tests is pretty straightforward, and for for linear mixed models, I would recommend the more complex they get, the the better it is to run a simulation. Actually, um, things get messy very quickly. Um, but these these are the key ingredients. The problem is that we don't talk about effect sizes in psychology a lot. So we don't talk about um, we only talk about yeah that's significant or it's really significant or it's not significant. But um, only when you consider effect sizes you. Can you even talk about yeah the magnitude of an effect how how big the changes you observed um and effect sizes can be measured for example in the amount of, of shift and mean you observe or um actually what's the really intuitive effect size is a correlation so if you have two continuous measures a correlation is an effect size the r value that's your effect size right um so, okay, there we talk about effect sizes, I must correct myself, but in, in typical behavior experiments with two groups, um, we don't get correlations usually, so we don't have effect sizes ready. And, um, right, so we can, for example, if you, if, if you, if you have worked with, with correlations, you can compare correlations much more easily than, than just looking at significant versus not significant, right? You can have a correlation of 0.3 that's significant and that's not significant because in one group you have 20 participants and in another you have 100. So that's why the concept of power is important. Um, so that's, that's my quick thing on power. One of the papers I have shared actually gets at the typical power and I will just try to share my screen again there we are so this is the one paper the the Bergman et al paper um, that has basically really based on the typical sample size and the meta-analytic effect size can you see this yes right or no you can't now you can <laughs> so this has this has per per phenomenon power based on the typical effect size, the, well, sorry, here, second to last column, and the typical sample size. So you really can plug these two numbers and assume you're doing a t-test, which is what we did because most people do t-tests, and then get at power. And you get anything between 99% here and 8%. So, and this is actually this 8% power phenomenon is something that people are really convinced of. So it's not like like it's it's wacky predicting the future kind of things that we're talking about here, but this is this is the the quick 
run through power. And we also now have to move Zoom out of the way. We have a quick power analysis tool that basically gives you this um, at MetaLab, this, this curve um, that gives you number of participants and your power because the effect size is fixed, right? So you get this nice curve. Um, so we extract the effect size from the meta-analysis, assume a t-test, and you see that this effect is big enough for 20, 21 participants being enough. But if you go back to word segmentation, it looks a bit different. So we get a 164 participants being enough for 80% power because the effect size is much smaller. So you can get a feel for power that way. Um, I also want to <laughs> secretly plug, or not so secretly plug, this paper, Six Solutions for More Reliable Infant Research, because it actually discusses ways um, that are underappreciated and increasing power a bit. So it really it starts with like infant research is often underpowered, right? So this is right on topic. Um, and this is measurement uh, reliability. So how, how big is the effect that you can observe based on the underlying effect? Um, so we discuss all these things because your measurement itself will always introduce noise, but if it introduces less noise, um, then it's, it's easier to pick up on even small effects. So this is this graph here that you can dig into. That's basically what I wanted to shamelessly, <laughs> shamelessly plug. So these two papers are really relevant to this discussion of power. Thank you, Christina. It 